So today we are sitting down here at the Wisconsin Vortex headquarters and we're going to talk about aperture versus field of view and how a binocular actually looks when you look through it and you use it out there in the field. So Austin and Jessica here and we have Mark Boardman from Vortex and Mike McDowell here and we are going to tear this apart. A lot of times terms come up objective brings more light maybe i have a wider field of view if i get a bigger objective tell us what's true and what's not true as far as field of view goes yeah that is probably one of the most common uh myths i have to bust uh why well, i'm obligated to for as an employee of vortex optics so <laughs> i don't mind i don't mind doing it they pay me to do it uh is that the aperture of a, of a binocular um, is synonymous with the field of view, that if the, if the lenses are bigger, you're going to have a wider field of view. That's generally not the case for several reasons that we're going to go through. Um, one that uh, I didn't even mention yet uh, is that the magnification is going to constrain your field of view. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, a wider uh, objective lens is generally going to mean the reason that you did so is because you have a higher magnification binocular. Uh, you don't make, I mean, you could, there are seven by fifties on the market, but they're not as popular as they once were. Um, but what, what specifically determines the field of view is the design of the eyepiece and somewhat the length of the binocular, but not the size of the objective, hmm. objective lens so much. Uh, this does determine how much light is going to enter the optical system. But if you were to compare a series, uh, a variety of 1042 binoculars or t all 1050s or all 842s, you're going to find a, a variety of field of view specifications out there. Um, so the manufacturer can determine narrow or wide field of view in the design of the eyepiece, the, very, the components of the lens elements in the eyepiece. Now, um, there are uh, reasons why a, a binocular with uh, larger objective lenses is going to be longer. To get the extra magnification that you want out of a larger aperture binocular, you're, you're going to go for 10, 12, maybe 15 or 18 power. The, the optic actually has to be physically longer to get that focal length so that you can uh, render that type of magnification. So the thing that is kind of a good model to work that off of is imagine you have a really long cardboard tube versus mm -hmm. a really short one. Which one's going to have the wider field of view? The shorter one. The shorter one, which is why if you uh, look at models like 832s or 1032s, they almost always have a wider field of view than a 10 by 50 or a 12 by 56. You can have exceptions to that. It all depends on uh, the manufacturer's specification, what they want for a field of view in any given binocular design. So it's we need to impress upon folks that just because the objective lenses are bigger, that doesn't necessarily translate to a wider field of view. As you increase magnification, field of view generally goes down. In other words, most eight power binoculars are almost always going to have a wider field of view than most tens. Most mm -hmm. tens almost always will have a wider field of view than 12s. 12s are almost always 15s, 15s sure. almost always. So the higher the magnification is, what you're kind of doing is you're, imagine this is your field of view in front of you, like a, a, an imaginary circle that looks about this big. You're magnifying it and cropping it. Mm -hmm. So you know that your linear field of view, feet at 1,000 yards, is, get, is becoming a smaller and smaller number. So if you... Uh, you think of field of view in degrees or linear feet, um, that's always getting narrower as you increase magnification as a rule. Mm -hmm. Just very little to do with the size of the objective lenses. So for a Western hunter that's trying to decide how wide the field of view should be as he's shopping for a binocular, does he even need to consider that? Does he just need to try it? What's the best way to tell how important it is to me? Yeah, this, this can become a really complicated decision uh, for the optics user because it's a game of pickup sticks. You change one thing here, something else happens there. On the one hand, uh, these are 1042s, and you would probably just figure that a 10 by 50 is going to be brighter in low light. Mm -hmm. But you're giving up field of view when you go from a 1042 to a 1050, just the opposite of some of the, the thinking out there. You are gaining uh, brightness by going with the 10 by 50, but you're cutting, you're narrowing your field of view. Now, it depends on the person. Do I want more of a panoramic 
and I'm willing to give up a little bit of low light performance, maybe it, maybe you're a 1042 person then. If you're like, no, the field of view in the 1050 is just fine and I cannot compromise on the low light performance. It all depends on where the user's premium, where they're gonna place the emphasis on that optic. But there is def a, a definitive pattern as you increase magnification and or increase aperture size, your linear field of view or your angular field of view is going to get narrower and narrower because you're magnifying, cropping, magnifying, and cropping. Hmm. I don't think we understand that as hunters enough, Mark. Would you agree? I mean, I'd, I'd agree 100%. And then, like Mike said, it's something that you hear a lot and when it comes down to selecting a binocular and maybe analyzing its field of view, I think you can look at a couple of things. Number one, you, you, you know, I, I, what's the difference? If you're, if you're maybe if you're comparing two models, it, is it a few feet? Right. That's going to be, it's not even, a, it's not going to matter. It's oh, going to be indiscernible, right, Mike? Sure. For example, these two binoculars, though they are both 1042s, uh, the field of view on the HD is actually just marginally wider. I think it's 346 feet at 1,000 yards versus, what was it, 360-something. Most people, that's so close, they're not going to be able to tell the difference. It's mm -hmm. close enough. It's 6.6 .6 versus 6.9 .9. degrees. Yeah. I mean, if you think of it in terms of a, you know, a line, how close they are to each other, you're talking just like, you know, if it were a foot, you're only taking off yeah. a very tiny piece. And when you're looking through an optic... Uh, if you're not really darting your eyes around to kind of, oh, there's a tree way over on the left-hand side. Now, if I look over on the right-hand side, can I see that farm over there? Mm, kind of. Oh, I moved it a little bit. I mean, you're not going to really be able to even tell with something like that out in the field that it's marginally a little bit wider. Now, if you were looking through uh, a 10 by 42... Um, compared to these that let's say it w was 270 feet yeah you're gonna it's gonna look more pinholey you know mm -hmm. like it's a s definitively smaller area because uh, you're making a significant drop in terms of field of view uh, and I always think it's a it's a good idea for peripheral detection to have the widest view field of view possible because that does get you something it's it's a good thing if something's going on that you otherwise might not have noticed because your field stop at the, the edge of the field of view was blocking it. Yeah, if you have a wider field of view, even if it's not in focus, you, yeah. something moved. You might not have seen that if mm -hmm. you didn't have a binocular with a wider field of view. Yeah, where it comes into play for me is almost selecting a binocular for a particular hunt, right? You know, like it, like Mike said, you know, uh, the, the 10 is going to have a wider field of view in general than the 12, than the 15, right? So there's some hunts where I might not be glassing at extreme distances, right? The 10 is going to be an advantage for me from a field of view perspective. And I've seen that happen. Like I brought a, tw a set of 12s uh, blacktail hunting one year, which actually the 12 by 50 is probably one of my just go to all around Western hunting binoculars. So I recommend that a lot. I use it a lot. However, on that hunt, it was just a little bit too much. I mean, I could still hunt. I could still glass, but I sure. was wishing I had those tens when I was glassing those clear cuts. And some, sometimes we're even glassing, you know, up to about a thousand yards away in some of those clear cuts. But still, in general, for that four, five, six, seven, eight type distance, I was kind of wishing I had the tens. Mm -hmm. uh, and conversely, uh, back when we used to have Mike, the Kaibab 15 and 20, mm -hmm. I gravitated towards the 15 because mm -hmm. I like that. Sure. I, mm -hmm. I appreciated that wider field of view over the yeah. magnification. Yeah, there's, there's kind of a, a, a myth in optics, bigger, better, faster, more. Yes. That higher is mm -hmm. always better, more is always better, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, it, let's, let's consider a hypothetical uh, 25 by 50 binocular, right? If you calculate exit pupil, aperture divided by magnification, that's a two millimeter exit pupil. That's hor horrific in low light. Sure. You think 25 power, oh boy. No, it's gonna, it's gonna be awful compared yeah. to a 10 by 50. Right. So same aperture, 50, both binoculars are letting in technically the same amount of light, but when you magnify it, you're just cutting off a huge portion of the amount of light that's going to get into your, your through your pupillary opening. And I've seen that with hunters we deal with. They want to buy the highest power. Say mm -hmm. they're going coos deer hunting. I want my 18s. Okay, but you got to realize mm -hmm. what size of that mountain you can grid at one time. And mm -hmm. if you plan on gridding that whole entire hillside in a mile or two away, it's going to take a considerable amount of time where if you're just simply looking for a deer or some movement, let's go back down to a 10 or 12, like you said, and mm -hmm. see a wider field of view, and you're going to be able to maybe pick up more movement, 
glass quicker in low light scenarios. And that's why I say you go to the highest glass you can afford. So you have that crisp contrast. Mm -hmm. You have that high definition mm -hmm. glance high, glass so you can see little movements and pick them out. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be zoomed in all the way to see mm -hmm. movement mm -hmm. a lot of times. Mm -hmm. You just need high quality crystal clear glass that you can see that movement, pick it out. And to a point that I heard you make in, in a, another video is when you tripod mount a binocular. I don't know if you were aware of this, but I once came across a uh, study that the U.S. Department of Navy did on the difference between tripod mounting a binocular versus uh, an unsteady platform like on a ship is comparable to doubling the magnification. <laughs> In other words, it, a 20 power binocular, just holding steady with your hands, you identify, resolve, see as much as you would a tripod mounted 10 power binocular. Hmm. Yeah. Think about that next time you buy the binoculars that you're going to bring out west because mounting them stable, having an easy mount that fits great, it's easy to look through and has a comfortable eyepiece for those long hours glassing, that's a big part of it. Thank you so much for sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. I hope that helps you out picking a binocular and getting ready for this year's hunting season. So like and subscribe this video. Thanks for following Hunt and Fool and our best friends here at Vortex Optics.